Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the um, Synergy Stand Symposium on Complete Revascularization Solutions in Complex PCI. I'm Franz Josef Neumann from Bad Krozing in Germany, and it's my pleasure to co-chair the session with Adrian Benning from Oxford, UK. A few introductory uh, remarks. Um, we have the ESC AACTS Task Force on the Evolution of Coronary Stents, and they recommended a two-stage evaluation of new stents, and this consists of objective performance criteria benchmarking and, of course, of large-scale randomized trials with clinical endpoint evaluation. So let's look at the Synergy stents, how it conforms with it. Uh, it's a stent with platinum chromium platform, very thin struts, good visibility, good conformability, low recoil, Everolimus eluting uh, stent with a proven release uh, kinetics and a bioabsorbable uh, polymer coating which is abluminal and very thin. Uh, we also by now have an extended length of the Synergy stent with some new features. It's 48 millimeters which makes it very convenient for long lesions and there had to be a few adjustments to make this uh, possible. I want to point out that uh, not all bioabsorbable polymer stents are equal. Uh, there are major differences between uh, the stents that are available with a bioresorbable polymer. And if you focus on the Synergy stent, you, you can see that it will release the uh, uh, Everolimus within three months and the bioabsorbable polymer is uh, gone by four months. So, so it'll turn in a bare metal stand very quickly. Uh, also, and I said this before, it has a very small um, uh, stand uh, di uh, strut uh, diameter, one of the smallest and uh, among uh, the stand struts with the, with the low um, diameter, it's the one with only a luminal uh, polymer. Now, Let's come to the performance criteria. We have Evolve, and this showed that the Synergy stance has a very favorable late lumen loss, which is uh, equal to the uh, PS of, of the stent, uh, uh, what would be PS with the car. And uh, it's even better numerically, at least, than the Promus element stent, but no significant difference. And, sorry, uh, we also have a large-scale randomized trial with uh, 1,600 patients included. And you can see that there are favorable three-year results with respect to the primary endpoint uh, target lesion failure. And there were also very few uh, stent thrombosis, uh, numerically lower than with the Synergy stent. And this uh, ended up in a one once uh, labeling for dubbed in the cases where with a very high bleeding risk. Uh, once again, uh, you can see the very low uh, stent thrombosis rate. So I, I think the uh, stent fulfilled the criteria of the task force, uh, so we can look at it. Uh, these are the session objectives, and uh, we will look at various uh, important features of the Synergy stent. And with this in mind, I would uh, give the word to Adrian to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much, Franz Joseph. So our first speaker is Giulio Stefani. Giulio is going to speak to us about PCI in high bleeding risk patients, device and pharmacotherapy considerations. Giulio, thank you very much. So thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Franz Josef, for the introduction. Actually, my name is Stefanini, not Stefani, but I like your pronunciation. How do I get out of this? It doesn't work. I'll try to talk without slides to, to stay in time. Let's see. Okay, this way it works. Tax manager. No. Okay, you see it works. Okay, good. Perfect. 
So I will try to stay in time. I actually will talk about PCI in high bleeding risk patients, focusing on device and pharmacotherapy considerations. These are my conflicts of interest. So I will start presenting a case since this is supposed to be a case-based symposium. And I will talk about a 76 years old female patient who has multiple risk factors, including diabetes, uh, chronic kidneys, obesity, and arterial hypertension. She, has a she had a history of stroke and uh, she was scheduled for hip replacement. Actually, this was an important limitation to her physical activity. And uh, uh, during the cardiological evaluation prior to surgery, she reported uh, dyspnea and extremely limited physical activity. In uh, my hospital, we take care of a lot of patients that have to undergo surgery. So we did actually perform an echo that showed a 60% LBEF, and we did perform a CT scan which showed a calcium score around 20. The patient was not too compliant. We were not able to do an evaluation uh, on an andrographic standpoint, and therefore she was scheduled for uh, and coronary angiography, invasive coronary angiography, which actually showed a minimal right coronary artery, but a significant coronary artery disease on the left circumflex. You see here these two lesions in the mid segment and in the distal segment, as well as an extensive lesion in the mid LAD. And this opens to a short discussion on, well, first of all, whether to revascularize or not this patient. I think that the answer is clear cut. Whether we should achieve complete revascularization or whether we should limit the treatment to the mid LAD. And then the timing, of course, whether we should wait for hip replacement or whether we should postpone hip replacement, that can be a matter of discussion. Whether to implant DES at ES or not in this patient, which is strictly connected with the DAPT duration. So, but let's start from the last point. DAPT duration, well, we have some nice guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology, which provide us a quite clear recommendation on DAPT duration after drug eluting sense implantation and bare metal sense implantation. They actually provide a class one recommendation for DAPT of a duration of one month after bare metal stents and a duration of six months after DES. However, in high bleeding risk patients, the guidelines do open a window for a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, shorter than six months that may be considered after DES implantation. We have to admit that the available evidence on high bleeding risk patients is extremely limited. So what are the guidelines based on? Well, first of all, on some post hoc analysis of uh, available observational data on uh, new generation uh, uh, drug looting stents, such as the Zotarolimus looting stents, this analysis provides evidence that actually a duration as short as one month may be sufficient after implantation of a new generation DES. And then we have two studies perspective. One is the Zeus trial, which included high bleeding risk patients that were treated with one month duration and showed a superiority of an endeavored Zotarolimus looting stent as compared to BMS4, a composite primary endpoint as well as, of course, the Leaders Free Trial. You're all familiar with this trial. It was presented uh, in 2015 and published in the New England Journal, which showed a superiority of a, a new generation uh, uh, polymer-free drug eluting stent as compared to bare metal stents in patient at high bleeding risk treated with one month DAPT. What I find quite interesting are the event rates of the leaders free. And in this slide, I tried to place them in perspective. What you have here are the event rates in leaders free as it relates to cardiovascular death, MI, TLR, and definite stent thrombosis for the uh, polymer free BES arm. And what you have instead in red are the upper range limit uh, of um, the objective performance criteria proposed by the uh, document of the ESC EAPCI uh, that actually kind of set ideal limits of uh, rates for uh, 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 contemporary drug eluting sense. And what you see here is actually that for cardiovascular death, MI, and definite stent thrombosis, the uh, polymer-free BES went quite above the uh, upper range limit of this OPC. This was not the case for efficacy TLR. So the question regarding safety is whether it's due to the device or whether it's rather due to the higher risk profile of the population included in the trial. It's a matter of debate. But let's focus about, about um, uh, uh, device considerations. So certainly to improve safety and performance of the device, there are a number of issues that are important. First of all, to improve uh, immediate uh, 
the outcomes, meaning arterial healing and acutrombogenicity, what plays a role is certainly strut sickness, which has an impact on endothelialization and therefore arterial healing, as well as platelet deposition. We do have evidence suggesting that thinner the struts, the uh, lower is the platelet deposition and therefore the lower is the thrombogenicity of the device. So strut sickness is an issue with respect to arterial healing and thrombogenicity and as nicely shown by Franz Josef Neumann, actually the, uh, the new generation DES all aim to have a very thin strut and the Synergy device performs quite well in terms of strut sickness. But what is also important is the persistence of the polymer coating over time. You probably already know this data that were published by myself and Robert in 2012, so already five years back, indicating that the uh, presence of a polymer coating that resorbs over time is associated with increased safety of the device in terms of definite stent thrombosis that is paralleled by a risk reduction for the composite of cardiac death or myocardial infarction through long-term follow-up to four years. So actually, biosorbal polymers should be favored in the development of new devices, which uh, is actually the case for most uh, available um, new generation drug looting stents, including actually the synergy that was nicely presented by Dr. Neumann. We must to underscore that not all biodegradable polymer coatings are equal in terms of time of resorption and the device on which they are applied also differ in terms of material and in terms of uh, drug release kinetics. In this summary that was already showed by uh, Franz Josef, you do see uh, biodegradable polymer DES that are available in Europe at this point in time, as well as some biosorbable scaffolds. And you do see that actually drug release uh, time changes across different devices, as the same is for the time of biosorbable polymer resorption. And uh, uh, in green, you see the resorption of the scaffold in BRS. And here you have some data specific on the Synergy uh, Everolimus looting stent showing quite a favorable arterial healing over six months. Already at three months, 94% of struts appear to be covered at OCT and 94% uh, are also well opposed. And this uh, rate increases to above 96% at six months. So favorable uh, uh, arterial healing for this device. With respect to safety, we now have the three years data of the Evolve 2 trials that were presented at ACC in March. Here you see a device specific outcome, meaning definite or probable stent thrombosis at three years in the Promos element group and the Synergy group. You see that in the Synergy arm, a, a overall four events were observed. What I wish to underscore is that three out of these four events occurred during the first 30 days. So there was only a definite stent thrombosis occurring beyond uh, the first year of follow-up, up to three years. A rate that was extremely favor at, favorable at three years, 0.5%. And trying to put this uh, event rates for stent thrombosis in perspective, you see in this slide uh, event rates for stent thrombosis at one year for a uh, trials that have been evaluating uh, contemporary biodegradable polymer-based drug eluting stents, such as the Biomatrix, the Nobori, the Orsiro, Ultimaster, and Synergy, and you can appreciate that uh, the event rate for definite stent thrombosis at one year uh, in patients treated with Synergy is extremely favorable, 0.2%. Well, moving on to the pharmacotherapy considerations, you should be aware that there are a number of studies ongoing evaluating the optimal duration and optimal regimen for uh, dual antiplatelet therapy after implantation of contemporary drug eluting stents. You probably are familiar with the leaders, uh, global leaders, the Twilight, as well as the uh, master DAP that is starting now evaluating short-term DAPT after implantation of the biodegradable polymer Ultimaster stent. Uh, with respect to Synergy, uh, we are now conducting the POEM study, which is a, evalu a prospective evaluation of um, the Synergy stent in high bleeding risk patients treated with one month DAPT. Actually, patients are included in the study if they comply with the same uh, inclusion criteria used in the leaders free trial. So, these are high bleeding risk criteria. They are treated with a synergy stent and are discharged with one month DAPT duration. 
uh, irrespective of the need for oral anticoagulation. Actually, in terms, uh, in patients needing oral anticoagulation, they uh, are treated with uh, only clopidogrel without aspirin for the first month. The primary endpoint of the study is a composite of cardiac death, MI, or definite stent thrombosis at 12 months, meaning the same primary endpoint of the leader three. And the powered is and the study is powered for um, non-inferiority with respect to uh, objective performance criteria uh, deriving from the leader three trial. The study actually started one month back. The first patient was included exactly one month back, and we are speeding up recruitment at this point in time. So trying to conclude the case that I showed at the beginning of this talk, actually what I did was, of course, to revascularize, achieve complete revascularization with the implantation of a, a, a synergy stent in the LAD. You see it in this slide, quite good result. And also in the circumflex artery, I, impl I implanted a direct stent in the distal artery, a synergy stent, and then again, two overlapping stents in the mid segment of the circumflex with an optimal result. The patient was included in the poem. Actually, it was the first patient included. He was discharged on one month dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel and aspirin, and the hip replacement was scheduled five weeks later, so actually next week. So just to conclude with another um, uh, important trial which is ongoing, which is the senior trial. This is a direct comparison of the synergy with the Rebel bare metal stent in patients above the age of 75. Patients are treated with one month DAPT if stable or uh, with silent ischemia and six months uh, DAPT if they presented with acute coronary syndrome. The, power, the trial is powered for a primary endpoint of MACE, meaning a composite of all-cause mortality MI stroke or ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization at 12 months. And the primary endpoint will be reported this year at ESC. Having said this, I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I uh, hand over the podium to the next uh, speaker. Bef be before you go, Julio, there are there's five minutes for some questions. There are two microphones uh, at the edges of the room. I suspect if you put your hand up and shout, we'll all hear you. So please, if you have a question for the presenters, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, so perhaps I could just ask, do you differentiate in the management of patients between a patient who needs an orthopedic operation and a patient who needs perhaps a cancer operation or an acute vascular operation? Or are all operations kind of the same in, in your mind? Well, actually, I care of the patient. If the patient has an important physical limitation because of a need for orthopedic surgery, but for me it's important, particularly because often these patients are old, and if they stay uh, uh, extremely limited for a long period of time, this affects their quality of life and, of course, has a prognostic impact. So, of course, uh, different uh, diseases that lead to the need for surgery should be considered differently. But on my standpoint, since the, um, uh, the benefit of the patient come first, I actually try to uh, guarantee the uh, shorter time as possible to the time of the operation. And would you restart the clopidogrel uh, after? No, no way. Right. So it's done? It's done. Simon. Yeah, clear. If they're not, uh, there will be a stent thrombosis, so that's the key message, I think, is that optimal implantation of the are still absolutely crucial. Yeah. There's a question in the back then? What do you do with the aspirin? With the aspirin, usually my, usually, uh, my surgeons try to uh, intervene uh, on aspirin, so on single antiplatelet therapy. And uh, I strongly recommend to continue aspirin uh, uh, during the time of the operation. Uh, eventually, aspirin can be interrupted, but with indeed some risk prior to the operation. And uh, it very much depends on the compliance of the surgeon. But actually, what Simon said is extremely true. I mean, optimal implantation is important. Uh, which, well, but we know this since several years, and our implantation techniques have significantly improved over time. Julia, may I ask, in your rationale for, for shortening the DAP duration, you, you were referring to Zeus and uh, the Leaders Free Trial, but they were performed with specific stents. 
is is the other results transferable to to other stents like the synergy is, that's, is this safe that's a key question so uh, my hypothesis is that actually these results are applicable to other new generation drug looting stents such as the synergy but that is exactly why i'm performing the poem trial i mean we are trying to validate these results in a population treated with uh, the synergy device Julia, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we may move on to Robert Byrne from Munich, Germany, and he will talk on a second case, optimal imaging in bifurcation lesions. So, Jos, uh, thanks very much for the uh, introduction and thanks very much to the organizers for the opportunity to be part of this interesting uh, symposium and to talk a little bit on bifurcation PCI and uh, imaging. Uh, these are my disclosures. So, uh, starting with the case then of a 70-year-old patient who is uh, stabilized after non-STEMI and has preserved left ventricular function, no significant RCI uh, disease, and you can see, uh, I think, a, a significant uh, stenosis in the distal uh, uh, left main stem, sorry, lapsing into German, uh, distal left main and uh, the osteal circumflex and uh, LAD with a complex uh, morphology, heavy calcification. Uh, the heart team uh, reviewed the case and the decision was for PCI. So when we talk about bifurcation uh, PCI, I think uh, there are a variety of two-stent uh, techniques that are available, uh, probably three only that are routinely used in clinical practice. And the first is a T-stenting technique or a modification on the T-stenting, uh, the uh, TAP technique. And here, uh, mainly used where the bifurcation angle distally approaches uh, 90%. The second is the uh, classical uh, culotte uh, stenting technique with uh, stenting of the side branch initially and then the main vessel uh, or vice versa and a significant amount of overlap of metal in the uh, proximal main vessel which is treated then with uh, uh, optimization technique and uh, crush or crush variants and the most recent crush variant that has gained uh, some acceptance is the uh, DK uh, uh, crush uh, technique with a uh, double kiss. Now actually when you look at the data uh, there's only four trials which compared the two stent uh, techniques in situations where two stents are necessary. And you can see they're all about three or 400 patients. Uh, so they have modest uh, power to detect differences. I think one thing stands out, and it's differences in the osteum of the side branch that seem to make the difference. Whereas if you look at the main vessel, proximal and distal, you've got very good results, actually, regardless of which of the two stent uh, techniques that you use. If you look at it in a little bit more detail, you can see if you uh, take crush, a, a classic crush, and compare it to a classic calotte, then there seems to be advantage for the calotte with lower uh, rate of uh, restenosis at follow-up in the Nordic II and in the Zeng et al. study. If you take DK crush, actually, uh, they uh, included only left main stem uh, patients, and here they did find uh, some uh, benefit, actually, for the DK crush over calotte perhaps some questions about the generalizability of these observations. And then recently we had from uh, Jose's team in Bad Crossing in the BBK, uh, BBK2 study, which uh, compared TAP and culotte and uh, saw a clear advantage for the classical uh, culotte. I think regardless of which of these two stent techniques uh, that you use, an integral part of the bifurcation PCI in the contemporary era is a uh, pot technique, proximal optimization. And this, of course, places uh, demands on the uh, stent backbone integrity of the proximal part of the stent uh, in the main vessel. Now, with this in mind, the Synergy stent, which you'll see here in orange, and indeed the uh, Proma stent system, are uh, notable for having uh, uh, labeled post-dilatation limits, which exceed significantly their uh, uh, their nominal limits, and you can see with the 225 to 275, you have uh, labeled post dilation up to 35, with the 30 and 35 devices up uh, to 4, 4.25, and with the 40 device, uh, you have limited, uh, you have labeled post dilatation limits of up to 5.75. So back then to the case at hand, and here the strategy uh, decision from the outset was culotte. Uh, the patient was randomized in ideal left main and allocated uh, to synergy. I'll briefly mention ideal left main because uh, we're going to hear a presentation later on on left main, uh, but this compares synergy and science. And the interesting aspect is that the synergy uh, arm uh, is per protocol treated with four months of dual antiplatelet therapy. And I can tell you that the study is fully enrolled and I think primary endpoint data is uh, expected next year. 
So uh, getting back to the case, the decision was made to predilate the lesion with a rotablation, contemporary uh, rotablation 1.5 burr. I think this uh, uh, Boston rotablation uh, system is uh, well known. I pulled up in the bottom right just this uh, league table. I know Adrian's probably feeling uh, bad with Brexit and everything that's going on, but you can see with uh, rotablation, uh, the UK are right at the top there at 3.1%, and uh, Germany looks like have a bit of work to do uh, with 0.8%. In terms of the future product uh, pipeline, what's coming down the line, I think, is uh, probably something that we're looking forward uh, to, and that's a, uh, a new uh, system. The old system has served us well, but definitely in need of optimization, and this will be a handheld device. So getting back to the case at hand, then uh, left main direction of circumflex with a, a synergy stent uh, and uh, post dilated, and then through the stent struts, then a synergy 3516, as you can see here from the left main into the LAD in classic uh, culotte, as we mentioned. And this is the final result in a very heavily calcified uh, lesion after successful lesion preparation on a 4030. Uh, kissing balloon uh, uh, in the direction of the LED and the left circumflex. Here's the IVUS pullback, however, and uh, that doesn't confirm the impression that the angiographic result was acceptable and probably uh, 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 highlights, I think, the importance of uh, careful imaging and bifurcation uh, PCI. And here you can see, despite lesion preparation, a uh, significant underexpansion at the ostium of the uh, circumflex. And then as you come back into the left main stem, you see then a better expansion of the entire left main uh, stent uh, segment. And after further high pressure uh, post dilatation, I think uh, the uh, final result then was acceptable. Uh, the patient then returned at three months uh, for, uh, for uh, follow-up, and here you can see a, a very nice uh, result in the left main stem, LAD, and uh, left uh, circumflex at a short uh, time point uh, after intervention. The second case I've brought uh, just was to illustrate uh, a second aspect of bifurcation, a PCI, and to look at a little more dealing, a, a, a little bit more detail after healing with the synergy stent. And here we have a 63-year-old patient who uh, presented uh, with stable angina and a, a previous no cardiac history. This case was performed as part of an OCT GSI study, which we're doing with uh, David Foley in uh, Dublin. And this was a Medina 111 uh, bifurcation lesion of the LAD and the diagonal, which you can see, uh, treated then in the classic clot uh, technique with two uh, long synergy stents and indeed a distal uh, LED synergy, which I haven't showed here, 3038 uh, in both directions and a, a kissing balloon angioplasty. Um, and I think you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide a very nice post-procedure result. And actually, this was very well maintained at a five-month uh, follow-up. Uh, and uh, at this time point, OCT imaging was performed as part of the study protocol in both the uh, LAD and the diagonal, and I present this to you here today. It's part of a project uh, which uh, we will uh, show in more detail here at PCR, and I'll allude to this in a moment. You can see in terms of the longitudinal pullback, I think very long segment stenting, but really uh, excellent uh, healing, no signs of uh, restenosis throughout the uh, main vessel stent and indeed the side branch stent. And I've brought some uh, segments from the proximal area of the main ve vessel and also of the distal. And you can see very nice healing profiles. Uh, and also, even at the carina of the bifurcation, I think uh, excellent outcomes. And I think this was broadly representative of all the 31 lesions that we looked at in this uh, study. We did also perform, as you'll see on the right, these uh, OCT grayscale signal intensity analysis uh, in order to get a read on the healing, because we know it's not just good enough that struts are covered. From the preclinical uh, work, we know that they need to be covered with viable or mature tissue. And uh, we looked at this in a little bit more detail, and apologies for the busyness of this uh, slide, but I think the overall impression here in the spread out uh, uh, vessel graphics, which uh, were prepared by Hamanshu and the team in the core lab, you can see very nice green dots are uh, covered and uh, red dots are non-covered. And you can see here very nice healing at an early time point after intervention, five months. And actually already at this time point, we could see that if you looked at the GSI scores, uh, significantly more than a half and approaching two thirds in the side branch of tissue could already be uh, classified as mature tissue. And I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, result. Uh, I show this as one case of the uh, Synergy Bifurcation OCT GSI study. Uh, and as I said, Hamanchu and the team uh, did a great job in the core lab in association with uh, Dave Foley and the other investigators. And uh, please go and visit this uh, poster if you'd like more details uh, during the course of PCR. 
So with that, I'll leave you with some recommended uh, reading. I think the uh, PCR textbook is a very good resource on bifurcation lesions and intravascular imaging. Some of the chapters are free during the time point of PCR. And uh, I think what's also a very good uh, resource is the bifurcation consensus document. And this was the most downloaded document from Euro Intervention uh, in the past year, and uh, certainly a recommended re reading for bifurcation PCI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, spectacular cases. Congratulations. Are there any questions from the audience? Robert, may I start off asking you, um, in how many percentage of the cases with bifurcation lesion do you uh, final uh, IVUS or final OCT? Do, do you think we, we always need it, or is it restricted to this left main? Or what's your approach? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting uh, a question, and we're here to share our experiences. I would say, uh, in terms of intravascular imaging in routine bifurcation, it's not something we frequently do. I think we do it in more selected cases. Um, how you select those cases, of course, is the next question. Do you do it in cases where you have a suspicion of a stent under expansion, very difficult lesion preparation? Yes, you're more likely to do it then. Are you more liberal in your use of uh, imaging when you're talking about a left main bifurcation a PC? and I think uh, you are. So I think we don't uh, do it uh, routinely in our bifurcation uh, PCI, and I know some uh, there are some proponents of using even intravascular imaging to help you choose the correct uh, uh, stent mesh to cross with your wire, but I think this has always been a, a step beyond me, and uh, I think it's, it's something that we do use in selected cases to optimize our implantation technique. It was a good example, though, wasn't it, that first case of an angiographic result which looked quite good, but actually how not only did you detect the problem, but you were able to influence it. And I think, you know, as we move towards a patient group where they're having stents rather than surgery, and surgery was a viable alternative, the scrupulous technique, the, the, the opportunity to take time to make sure that we've done our best job, it, it's, it's got to be the right thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we were talking earlier, and it's definitely true to say that we are seeing more and more complex uh, patients in our practice uh, due to aging population, due to more patients being referred for TAVI, and uh, it's something that's noticeable uh, in our center in recent years uh, that we're treating a lot more of these complex patients with difficult lesion uh, preparation issues like uh, the case that we saw earlier. And um, I think uh, uh, certainly our uptake of rotablation has uh, increased uh, uh, significantly and uh, intravascular imaging is an important part of the, the, the jigsaw to ensure optimal uh, stent deployment. Uh, Simon alluded to it earlier on when we're talking about the these elderly patients who perhaps can't tolerate such long or du durations of dual antiplatelet, then we really need to make sure they leave the cath lab with an optimal uh, PCI result. Robert, I, I, I noticed that you chose um, the culotte technique for, for the left main. So, so, so you don't trust DK crush study, or <laughs> what was it the, the angle you, you, that made you chose, choose the, uh, the culotte technique? Uh, so, you know, I think uh, our technique of choice is the culotte technique, and this is one, of course, uh, each center and each operator probably has a go-to technique, and uh, it has, we're, uh, you know, it's established uh, as our preferred option. Um, DK Crush uh, 3 uh, does look uh, convincing in terms of the data that I showed. They seem, seem to show an edge for DK Crush, and I suppose the peculiarity of the study is it was just left main uh, stem patients. Uh, it's not something that we have adopted uh, so much in our practice. We feel that we're uh, well served with uh, culotte. We look at uh, your study, we look at BBK2, and I know that I think only 17% uh, of the patients were left main stem uh, bifurcation uh, PCIs. Uh, but still, the totality of the evidence, I think, supports uh, culotte, and it's uh, it's certainly uh, our preferred approach. There are two caveats, and uh, one, of course, is the bifurcation angle is different in left main PCI than it is in LAD diagonal. And this may be something that speaks a little bit against culotte because it puts more strain on the, uh, on the culotte uh, stents. I think this is an important uh, consideration. And the second is you have a tendency for more uh, vessel caliber mismatch between the uh, proximal uh, left main and uh, one of the distal vessels, which also 
puts a strain on uh, your clot technique. And for this reason, we've applied for funding to do a left main stem bifurcation PCI study, and uh, maybe we can, uh, some of us can get together and do this, uh, comparing a T-stenting based technique uh, against clot. And there's the ongoing EBC trial, of course, one stent versus two, um, which is not quite the same question, but it, it, it's in there. And it, it is the ostium of the circ, of course, which is, uh, is, is the Achilles heel. It's a, you know, it is difficult to dilate, uh, it is prone to restenosis, and it is, it is an issue for us for the, the mechanical reasons that you've suggested, and it needs good scaffolding from a, a metal stent. I mean, I think you saw it in this case here as well, and it's, it's something uh, that comes up uh, often in, in our practice. And uh, when you look at the data, I think these four studies, you can see it's all the side branch osteum where the problem is. Although the prognosis is very much determined by the main vessel. I mean, obviously, it's slightly different in the main, but we shouldn't get distracted. I think we haven't perhaps spent a lot of time worrying about restenosis, the osteum of smallish diagonals. And we've got to make sure that that proximal, and as you said in your presentation, the optimization of the, uh, of the stent proximal to the bifurcation is absolutely crucial. And if we leave that uh, stent under-expanded, under we're not doing our patients a favour. Robert, that was great. Thank you very much indeed. So our next uh, presenter is uh, Javier Eskened, a friend and colleague, who's going to talk about the importance of physiologic assessment in multivessel disease. Javier, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian and Franz Josef. It's, uh, of course, a great pleasure to be with you here. Uh, let me just, and to, to share um, this uh, discussion about the use of physiology in, in patients with multivessel disease. <coughs> oh, those are my conflicts of interest. And as an introduction, I would like to mention that, well, nowadays FFR is used predominantly to interrogate intermediate severity stenosis. This is the, actually the recommendation that is stated in the clinical practice guidelines and actually is the one that um, overwhelmingly we see in clinical registries and studies. But it's interesting that this uh, approach contrasts very much with the evidence that was provided by one of the major studies on um, comparison with angiography, that is the FAME study, that was performed in patients with multivessel disease and where interrogation of every stenosis that was a potential PCI target was recommended irrespective of the stenosis severity. And as a matter of fact, this is a glimpse just of some of the patients that have been included in the um, Syntax uh, tr 2 trial at our center, illustrating the enormous power that physiology has in reclassifying the functional involvement of triple vessel disease. So by definition, these patients that you see at the left were patients that um, would uh, be treated in the Syntax trial, the original Syntax trial with uh, stents because they, they were uh, deemed to be significant stenosis, when you perform functional assessment with pressure guide wires, you actually see that only um, a minority of them, 58% of them, it's not a minority, but there's a, a huge decrease in vessels, uh, have two vessel disease or one vessel disease. So there is only 42% of patients that remain having triple vessel disease from a functional point of view. But something else that uh, comes from using pressure guide wires in vessels in, that apparently may look significant is that in addition to establishing the hemodynamic relevance of the stenosis, you may obtain information that is very important in planning your intervention. And in this regard, one of the most important aspects is what we call vessel mapping that uh, basically is the FFR pullback that has been used for a long time and that can allow us to identify, identify those segments that should be addressed during revascularization. And this, of course, is of enormous importance for planning your intervention. So to illustrate that, I would like to share with you one case performed at our center. It's a patient that he had 54 years old, 54 years uh, presented with um, um, a chest pain at rest he had, over the last week, a couple of episodes. Um, he had some risk factors, as you can see here. And immediately in the EKG, it was possible to see that he had some uh, ST depression in, in uh, lead number three, the way inversion in anteroceptal leads. And there was a raise in cardiac biomarkers. Uh, and although, of course, the, the left ventricular uh, function was preserved, etc., uh, he underwent coronary angiography. And he was found to have 
two vessel disease, as you can see here. You can see this diffuse involvement of the left anterior descending and a very tight stenosis in the le circumflex artery that was identified as the culprit of this acute coronary syndrome. So right coronary artery was fine. So he was treated um, ad hoc um, with a drug eluting stent, uh, the culprit artery, and if it is customary, we did not treat the non-culprit uh, stenosis, and that was um, left for assessment, for further assessment. So um, after the treatment of the left circumflex, we performed some um, risk assessment of what will be uh, treating this left anterior descending coronary artery. So this is the residual angiographic syntax score after you, do, you have treated the, the left the circumflex. And we found that from the perspective of um, the syntax to a score, you had equipoise for cabbage or PCI. It's true that now that the patient had a DES implanted in the circumflex, obviously you are much more biased towards performing PCI. But in any case, those are the um, um, scores that we calculated uh, after this. So we, pending actions in this uh, non-culprit vessel in the LAD was to perform physiology guided revascularization. Uh, we planned to perform uh, vessel mapping with the Comet Guidewire and to perform translation of FFR findings to coronary anatomy. And then in case that it was, uh, we were planning to perform the PCI to guide and to optimize this procedure. And for that, we uh, use the Comet uh, guide wire. I don't know if you have experience with it, but it's an excellent state-of-the-art FFR wire that uh, has a number of features that makes possible to use it in very complex disease. It has a fantastic steerability uh, due to the collaboration between Boston Scientific and Asahi in making the, their very famous um, wire tips using the Acton system. And you have also the... Um, a fiber optic uh, uh, signal that um, is very resistant to having pressure drift. You have also the rotation of the adapter to the wire. So that's it's a very nice uh, wire, as you will see now in, in this case. So again, uh, just to refresh and to see in motion those images, you can see that there is a long involvement of the vessel. This is the preparation of the comet wire that, uh, like any other pressure guide wire, starts by uh, making sure that you have um, proper balancing of pressure signals once that you reach the tip of the catheter. That's basically what we are doing now. Um, and you can see in the right bottom panel how the pressure is now being equalized. Um, and you measure that. And now what we are doing here is to use dynamic road mapping to advance our wire. This is a fantastic technique. Uh, you don't need to give contrast. Uh, you just uh, store the last image that you have is uh, technology developed by Philips, but there are other vendors that are developing this type of technology. Soon it will be in your hands. And this has an enormous advantage, is that now you can make interrogation of the vessel and you can make a pullback and check what are the physiology changes that you are seeing there, the FFR values, and the correspondence with the specific segments. So as you can see here, we have hyperemia. We are pulling back the wire, as you can see now, very slowly. And you can correlate beautifully the location inside the coronary artery of the sensor with the measurements that you have there. In other words, you have angiographic uh, FF physiology co-registration. And you can repeat it any time. You can stop. Um, you don't need to give contrast, of course. Remember that one of the problems that you had with the FFR, um, uh, co contrast FFR, is that you cannot make injections. In any pullback, if you make an injection, you ruin your pressures. With this, you can beautifully correlate the physiological findings with the anatomy. And it was clear uh, during this pullback that we had a long segment that deserved treatment. And actually, uh, basically, here you have the um, image in dynamic road mapping. You can see here, and we were just paying attention, of course, to the modification of the FFR signal. And we deducted from this that we had to treat this segment of 45 millimeters. We optimized this by QCA, trying to guess what would be the size of the stent that we required. And of course, the next step is how to treat this very long segment. Um, well, uh, we moved first uh, to perform uh, predilation specifically of the segment that had this stenosis. Again, you 
can introduce your gear and not give uh, contrast with dynamic road mapping. We were just performing some uh, predilation, as you can see here. And of course, to avoid overlapping, we opted to use a very long stent. Well, the longest stent that we have available is a 48 millimeter 2.5 synergy stent. So you have the advantage of not having multiple overlaps, or, but as you know, uh, are associated to, to, to uh, worse uh, healing, of course. And uh, again, you can see beautifully the deployment of, the, um, of these uh, 48 millimeters BBS exactly in the locations that we have identified using intracoronary physiology. Uh, so we are now deploying the stent uh, only with predilation of the proximal part because we thought that that was basically what uh, it was required. Here you are seeing the deployment of the stent. You can even match the size of the stent when the balloon is inflated with the diameter of the, sur of the, of the neighbor vessel. And uh, after that, what we performed was a um, dynamic uh, um, uh, live uh, stent boost. So we could see that the stent was beautifully um, expanded and opposed. Uh, and this is facilitated, of course, by the degree of radio opacity of the synergy stents. So basically, here you have the three steps. Uh, FFR pullback plus integration of physiology and anatomy contrast-free deployment uh, of the stent, and then um, guidance of extended expansion using this uh, enhanced uh, modality of uh, stent boost. Now, um, just one final word about the use of the synergy stent. We, as you know, it's a stent that has extremely low rate of um, uh, thrombosis, uh, even more if, like in a segment like this, you are avoiding overlap. And I think that um, it really facilitates also the possibility of expanding. If you have uh, major changes in, in diameter of the vessel over this long segment, the ability to expand with post-inflation, with, um, post the scenery extent ensures that you can obtain a very good result. My final remarks is um, in, in patients with multivessel disease, pressure guideway interrogation frequently leads to functional reclassification of the number of affected vessels, but also provides additional information that is key for planning the intervention, particularly through vessel mapping. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Javier. That was great. So you, you, you were able to track that long stent on the pressure wire itself? You did the whole case just with the comet wire? Yes, that was performed um, with the comet wire. Yes, so you're able to do the whole case with physiology and deploy the stent just with, just with the one wire? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the experience we have with the Comet wire is that, uh, well, it's a state-of-the-art wire for um, working in, say, complex anatomy. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it was designed for this particular purpose. So in a way, that's also part of the mismatch of keeping using these wires just to interrogate simple uh, uh, um, intermediate stenosis. I think that the, the, the true benefit of this, and and... Adrian is the co-investigator also in the um, Syntax 2 trial, will be demonstrated later that physiology should be routinely introduced in the management of complex disease. I think that it's, the, it's probably the next extension in the use of physiology. Sure, you're right. Uh, I, I noticed that there was also some um, disease proximal to the stent. Did you check the result with the, with the FFR wire again after placing the, the long stent, or do, did you feel that, that it was okay, like it was? No, well, actually, we, we felt that it was okay because what it was very clear is that when you reached the point of the proximal area of deployment of the stent, there was no grade whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So um, we were pretty happy about the, the result. But in any case, it's, again, something that you can obviously uh, do. One of the beauty of this is that you could see outlined clearly that the bifurcation was not involved by, um, say, the segment that you had to treat. So that was part of the way of simplifying the treatment. I mean, increasingly, you know, the, a lot of the debate that we have in the MDT is about what is the functional significance of the lesions in the LED and what is the viability. I mean, pressure wire becomes such an important part of how we make decisions, doesn't it? And uh, one wonders really whether we should be making how many decisions we should be making without uh, pressure wire assessment? Because it, it, once you, once you realise that the angiogram is so potentially misleading, it changes kind of everything, doesn't it? Absolutely, and that and that you see uncertainty applies not only to uh, a given uh, stenosis, but also extends in the in the long axis of the vessel. Uh, 
So you, if you do not perform in these situations a pullback, you run the risk to uh, rightly know that there is something that is flow limiting, but extending in the wrong place, yeah. which is can be which can be disastrous. And I think that that's something that you see. We we are of course in the as 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 this gets uh, adopted more and more. I think that we will be moving to the next generation that will be ensuring that you are achieving proper uh, revascularization based on physiology. And potentially that would be augmented by alternative uh, imaging as well. If we can get some of that information from CT, it may, it may only be indicative, it may not be absolute, uh, but I think it will, it will be valuable. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Thank you. Javier. Now we can go on to the fourth case, uh, synergy and the hybrid approach in CTO, PCI, and Simon Walsh will be talking on this Uh, first, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to run through a few bits and pieces, um, start with my disclosures. So I think it's important we sort of stop and draw breath and review where we are with CTO-PCI. Uh, right now, there's been a, a bit of noise made over the last couple of years in terms of uh, randomized trial data that's appeared. So to address the question of should we treat CTOs, I think is an important one. I'll spend just a, a short time on it. Decision CTO uh, splashed uh, in a big way at the ACC uh, past, and I think uh, a sort of fairly critical review of this uh, trial is important. Uh, and what's very clear is that it was highly selected, easy lesions, with a very low volume of patients put into it each year. And I think this is actually a study of multi-vessel PCI plus or minus CTO PCI, uh, and not CTO PCI versus OMT, which is what it was designed as. Uh, we do have a lot of missing data in it. Uh, we do have MACE endpoints driven by small troponinitis associated with PCI. And we certainly don't have patients assigned to the groups that, that were intended uh, throughout the trial. So I think for us to draw valid conclusions on decision CTO, we need to be extremely guarded. And I think all that we can say from it is that for those who had CTO PCI in addition to other vessels treated, that their MACE reduction was substantial at five years. Uh, so those who were completely revascularized are likely to do better. Beyond that, it's hypothesis generation only. In terms of how we approach CTO lesions, so assuming that it's still worth treating them, which of course it is, um, the question is how do we go about it? And uh, there's been a lot of, of um, education and time and effort spent in terms of um, getting people better at opening completely occluded vessels. Uh, the hybrid algorithm has been around for quite a few years now and basically what it does is it encourages operators to switch between strategies uh, according to the anatomy within the vessel that they're faced with and to make sure that the patient ends up with an open artery and to emphasize what Javier had said about uh, minimizing the use of radiation and contrast while you're doing that. Uh, the recharge study uh, was completed and uh, published last year, uh, and basically that's a very large uh, study which is aiming to see if it's applicable uh, to move the hybrid algorithm out of CTO subspecialist centres and operators to lower volume centres uh, around the European region. Uh, again, uh, a large trial of almost 1,200 patients um, and um, a number of centres across the uh, continent and the UK. And there are a few messages that keep coming up and up again and again in uh, CTO-PCI. And uh, the first thing is that if you look at very simple lesions here with JCTO scores of 0 and 1, short, defined, tapered caps, wire escalation strategies are highly effective in opening them almost all of the time. However, if we want to actually treat all our patients who deserve revascularization on the basis of viability and symptoms, what you need are complex techniques for complex lesions. So it's not enough to poke a wire at a lesion and say, sorry, it can't be done. I think if you want to do CTO properly, you need to afford the patient op op options in terms of their treatment within the case. Overall, despite a high complexity uh, of the lesion subset within the trial, 1,200 patients were treated and uh, after repeat attempts, uh, almost 90% success rate. And that's without excluding anybody on the basis of anatomy. So the only qualification to get in was ischemia and viability. So we don't throw people out because the lesion looks difficult. So what do we conclude from recharge? Basically, uh, the hybrid algorithm is applicable beyond oligocenters, as uh, EO Dens termed it, and very high volume operators, and can be taught and extended out to other centers. All you need to do is apply time and to learn the techniques. It's safe, it's effective, and the use of radiation and contrast is low. And it is applicable, and we've shown this across many geographies now and across many thousands of patients. 
So then we come on to the question of how do we improve patient outcomes. And uh, I think this is where our CTO begins to fit as part of the jigsaw puzzle. And we know and have known for quite a long time that the more residual ischemia you leave a patient with, the more likely they are to die or to have a MACE event. So large burdens of residual ischemia and high residual syntax scores are not a good thing to have left behind. If we're going to open CTOs, we want to treat patients effectively with stents that are not going to re the nose, they're not going to fracture, they're not going to have adverse healing, uh, potentially aneurysm or stent thrombosis. So a lot of the themes that we've been discussing already today. So we'll get on to the case example finally. So this is a, a relatively young patient. He's got FFR negative uh, moderate left main and mild LED disease. He's got a long complex occlusion in his right coronary artery over 40 millimeters in length and something fairly similar in a large circumflex vessel. There's a bit of infarction on in his MRI in the PLV segment of the right, uh, but otherwise everything else is viable and also ischemic. How do we approach this case? Well, based on the anatomy, uh, we use a retrograde approach uh, to deal with the right coronary artery, which is actually opened with a reverse cart or a retrograde dissection re-entry procedure. And interestingly, just uh, the way things panned out, this patient was actually treated with durable polymer uh, everolum saluting stents uh, at his first procedure back in October 2014. He deserves complete revascularization, um, so we brought him back and then subsequently treated the left circumflex. As is often the case in the circumflex, it can be challenging with tortuosity. We have a defined proximal cap here, so we're able to approach this with the anti-grade dissection and re-entry technique. So we're using a microcatheter, which looks like Corsair, and a knuckle wire to overcome anatomical ambiguity without perforating the vessel to facilitate the use of a cross-boss catheter and then Stingray dedicated re-entry device. And on the left panel, you can see this is not the angiographic um, projection that you would do re-entry in with the Stingray itself, but we have the Stingray balloon deployed here, and we've done a stick and swap. Where we've punctured the vessel with the Stingray wire, and then put a secondary wire into the uh, true lumen of the circumflex. The patient was enrolled in a consistent CTO study, and uh, had synergy biodegradable polymer everolum saluting stents implanted in the left circumflex, and that's the acute procedural result. And this is where we get on to a bit of thought provocation. So he comes back at 12 months. <clears throat> All patients in the consistent CTO study have angiographic and OCT follow-up. Uh, and this is how the circumflex looks, which I think you'll agree is reasonable. There's a bit of moderate uh, re-stenosis, but nothing flow-limiting. And certainly the patient symptomatically was well. However, the right coronary uh, doesn't look quite so pretty. Uh, distally, uh, we still have disease at the PLV, which we weren't uh, uh, trying to treat at all. Uh, the PDA is remodeled a bit and maybe needs tidied up. But you can see that the reverse cart segment has got quite disrupted. Aneurysm has formed. Uh, and this is something that we do see from time to time. It's not tremendously common, but it, it does happen. And it brings us on to the question, does aggressive and early healing in the vessel uh, lead to important differences in outcomes, particularly in CTO-PCI, and particularly for these patients who have complex anatomy and who need complex techniques to reopen them? You can see the aneurysmal segment on the right half of the panel here in the uh, right coronary artery, uh, where the vessel has remodeled uh, and the dissection has not settled down. And we've seen several of these heal up over a couple of years or longer uh, with good outcomes for the patient clinically, versus the early and rapid healing, also within a dissection segment, but with less disruption, with the synergy stent in the left panel. Where does this sort of take us? Well, I think we've looked very closely at this. Almost a 1,000 patients amongst UK um, uh, centres and, and we found a low MACE rate overall among CTO PCI procedures including those who've had dissection techniques. So across this study of, of um, over 800 patients uh, we did not find the use of dissection techniques predictive of MACE uh, in our groups. We did see a bit more re-stenosis and re-intervention with reverse cart based procedures but they're the most complex patient group, post cabbage, long stent lengths, diabetics etc. So that's not unsurprising. We will have data for you to tell you some more details soon. So the consistency TO study is now fully recruited. And this will be the best or be uh, biggest description, I think, of the most complex lesion set that have ever been uh, sequentially followed up by angiogram and OCT at uh, 12 months after CTO PCI. And we hope to have that ready for next year. And just to, to show and share some results from the consistent study, this is another ADR case where we've got Stingray-based re-entry into the LED. Uh, angiographic result after successful revascularization. And this is how the OCT and angiogram looks at 12 months. So all of these patients are treated with synergy as part of the protocol. 
and we're not seeing disastrous aneurysmal things coming back. We see our share of restenosis, as we'd expect in complex disease, but nothing um, quite like we, what we'd have observed, observed historically. There's another case was done live to ACI a couple of years ago. Um, complex lesion in the right, very large uh, posterolateral branch done with reverse cart. This patient had 15 centimetres of synergy implanted with reverse cart, and this is what the angiogram and OCT looked like at 12 months. So, where are we right now? With CTO-PCI, can we do it? Yes, our results are comparable almost to non-occlusive disease. Uh, should we do it? I think we should do it to completely revascularize patients who've got large burdens of ischemia uh, with viable tissue. If we're putting a stent in, it needs to be something that lasts, so it needs to be conformable, it needs to have efficacy in terms of the drug, not fracture, and subsequently to heal well. And we keep getting focused on engineering and on stent deliverability. Javier has already shown how to deliver a 48 millimeter uh, synergy stent on a comet wire, and this is how easy it is. So this is a long CTO segment in a right coronary artery. So I think right now deliverability is not a question that we should be asking ourselves about in terms of stent engineering and outcomes. What we need to think about is durability for the patient. So <clears throat> CTO-PCI, I think, is around to stay. It's a big part of the complete revast jigsaw puzzle from a percutaneous perspective. If we want to compare to CABG, we've got to get it right, and we've got to get it right long term. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. Those who want to pick up on CTO in detail, you're welcome in London, and that's, we'll leave that with you as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, excellent talk. Are there any questions from the audience? May, may I start with these long, complex uh, recanalizations? Do you extend uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy, or do you just go with the six months or even three months? Unless you're in a study, then? no. So it's uh, standard 12-month uh, DAPT. In fact, we've a very broad experience of uh, very complex lesions in Belfast that we published uh, last year, the year before, uh, looking at three months of DAPT uh, discontinuation for clinical reasons in extremely complex disease, CTO, left main, bifurcation, etc. And stent thrombosis rates are extremely low. So we're very comfortable to stop DAPT early, even with this degree of complexity anatomically. Mm -hmm. Stent fracture, Simon, is something that, you know, particularly in the right coronary, we underestimate, probably under... Is your comment that we... Do you think we've sorted stent fracture, or are we, do we have to wait and see a bit longer yet? No. Uh, stent fracture is not sorted, so the best way to avoid it is no overlaps. So where you have 48, 38 millimeter stents, uh, trying to have minimal overlaps. Tortuosity, there is a fracture risk uh, where you've got excursion and twist of a vessel and hinge points, unfortunately, stents still do fracture. Uh, grafts with uh, deep breath, actually, you'd be amazed how much they move. So stent fracture's not gone, but the stent platform does affect the fracture risk. So the more connectors you have, the more likely fracture is, and even within subsets, actually how the connectors are designed will enhance or uh, reduce your fracture risk. So I think that's something you need to understand and be careful about whenever you're uh, treating this type of disease. Good question over there. Oh, no, I mean, we, we uh, well, the, the FFR redo question in terms of CTOs is actually a misnomer. Uh, what happens whenever you have hyperemia is actually you get steel from the CTO segment, which becomes more ischemic. It's not that you get a false result in the open vessel with the lesion. So you can generally believe in FFR and the LED in those circumstances. Um, for that, I mean, if it's a surgical case and the patient's fit for surgery, he goes to surgery in our centre the way anybody else would send him. If he's not a surgical case, then we'll do complete revascularization percutaneously with optimization, we hope, and adjunctive imaging. And the management of that funny aneurysm thing, clopidogrel and cross your fingers? We've observed a number of them over the years, and basically um, it's a small number. It's half a dozen, I think, and they tend to heal up with... with um, we haven't seen them with Synergy yet. I don't know if that's just because we haven't had it around for long enough, but um, uh, we give 12 months of DAPT, we treat the patient as normal, and they tend to resolve over a period of time. It's probably two to three years, um, but we haven't seen any of them cause trouble. 
Well, the, the the imaging quality is is, is not too well, but but um, looking at the, the first case, I noticed that there was a stenosis distal to the stent in the right coronary artery, yep. not only in in the in the uh, in, in the posterolateral branch, but also just before the PDA. What, what why did you leave it and? I would have been concerned that this stenosis would be due to a di residual dissection, which maybe in this projection you didn't see, and then sure. you get a retrograde problem. And CTO PCI, uh, so the, the, the RPL branch was related to some infarct, which is why we didn't go after that. Uh, so what we tend to do, have to do is to make a judgment call on terms of distal lesions beyond the occlusion. We've got a low threshold for leaving them alone, ibising them, and if there's not a large burden of atheroma uh, in terms of the uh, volume within the vessel, uh, they tend to remodel positively and not require extensive stenting. So if you can avoid an extra 20, 30, 40, whatever amount of stent, then it's better. So we tend to bring the patients back and reassess them in a f uh, three months. Mm. Uh, and uh, most often you, you leave those alone rather than treating them. Thank you very much, Simon. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> so our final speaker is Dr. Lesiak, who's going to talk to us about Left main PCI with the synergy stent. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much for inviting me. That's my conflict of, of interest. So left main is uh, a different animal of, of the regular bifurcation. So it's a large and short vessel. Uh, bifurcation is involved in like 80%. Uh, it has a very important side branch. Actually, it's uh, the most important side branch we have uh, in our coronary circulation. Uh, the bifurcation angle is usually very wide, and the uh, lesion is often uh, calcified. So this study was, do was done in Rotterdam uh, by Robert Jan van Guns, uh, and they show that in the European population, among males, left main is always more than five. Yeah, there were only 13% 13, 13 of patients with left main diameter less than uh, five millimeters. So it's very, very, uh, very important because we usually treat uh, bifurcation lesion according to uh, uh, the, the, the guidelines uh, and we size the stand according to distal reference uh, to avoid the uh, carina shift. Then we do the pot to oppose the struts uh, to the proximal uh, main vessel, which is left main. Uh, and then we do something if necessary with a, with a, with a, with a side branch. And this is for the left main, it's uh, tricky because, for example, if you look at this table and you have a side branches like CERC 3O and uh, LAD 3.5, then left main is not 4O, but it's almost 4.5. Yeah? So you, you should know uh, the expansion capacity of your, of, of your stent. A synergy stent is a great device. You heard a lot of this. Uh, the, the, the stent is a very thin strut, 74 microns, uh, covered with aluminum by bioresolvable polymer and uh, with a very small amount of drag. Uh, you see that the, the layer is at least a half, so it's a very thin layer, a half of the diameter of the red blood cells, so it's, uh, so, so it's really very, 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 very thin. Uh, these are the expansion capacity, uh, capacities of the capacities of the stent, uh, and you, you, you can see that, that for for all stent, which we like to use for left main, you can go up to 575, so it really gives you a, a possibility of, uh, of treating uh, almost any vessel uh, in, 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 in human body. So size really matters. Uh, the ideal study uh, is a study that investigated the two different strategies just for the left main uh, stenting, all the, all the left main, uh, all kind of lesions. Uh, with two dry eluting stent. One is stent with durable uh, polymer uh, eluting uh, everolimus, and the second stent is a synergy stent uh, with uh, biosolvable polymer uh, eluting also serolimus. You know, more than 800 patients uh, randomized uh, in, in this study. Uh, and the crucial thing is that those two arms will, will randomize not only to stent, but also to uh, uh, dual antiplated, uh, antiplated therapy. So the durable polymer stent, according to previous guidelines, uh, patients were treated uh, with dual antiplated therapy for 12 months, whereas in the uh, biosolvable polymer arm, the synergy stent, uh, DAPT was 
was stopped after four months. Enrollment is complete, so we are really curious to, 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 to see the results of the study, especially the, the clinical results, because the primary endpoint was a clinical endpoint that was a maze uh, of composite, uh, of any death of any cause, myocardial infarction, and ischemia driven, uh, driven TVR. So the results will be presented, I think, next year, because the, that's two years um, follow up. Then a couple of secondary endpoints, and I want to draw your attention to one special endpoint, which is uh, marked in red. This is OCT uh, endpoint after three months uh, for a chosen group, subgroup of patients. So please save the date uh, because it will be presented during this uh, meeting uh, Thursday, uh, room 252 by, by Robert Van Gens uh, at 10.56. Uh, so we'll have an opportunity to see the results. So just one patient from my center. Uh, it's a 60-year-old male uh, with a couple of comorbidities. You, you see um, myocardial infarction in 2000, hypertension, is, uh, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, also some chronic kidney disease, and this is the, um, this is the lesion. It doesn't look very severe, and uh, th this is why it's, it's, it's very useful to use some intravascular imaging because uh, when we put it at the IVOS, uh, we are really surprised to see this dense calcium uh, with almost circumferential uh, calcium, superficial calcium deposit is like more than 270 degrees. Uh, of course, uh, significant tough lesion in the, in the, in the, in the, LAD, in the left main and also a lesion in, in, in the LAD. So the patient was uh, knowing this, I've known this, we, we used the flex stone, we used the mm, cutting balloon to prepare the lesion, 3.5, 12. Uh, then we used the crossover technique. Uh, we didn't mean to, we didn't want to, in the beginning, to stand the, the, the circumflex. So this is Synergy 3.0, 32, uh, up to 18 atmospheres, so the long one. Uh, then, then pot with 4.5, 12. Uh, and now you see the rewiring uh, process uh, with this kind of stand. When you do the proper pot with properly sized balloon, then it's, it's, it's really easy. It's, it's, it takes seconds to, to, to find the, the distal strut and to push the, 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 the wire uh, down, to the, down to the artery. Uh, then we kiss and uh, on the uh, stand enhancing uh, imaging you see What's the difference between the proximal part of the stand and the, and the distal? So you see that the, 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 the pot really works. So this is the result on angiography. <coughs> we were not uh, satisfied with the, with the circ because you see that there is some haziness here. We didn't touch the, the circ before the, the, the stenting, just uh, we did the kissing. So in a, say, in, a, in, a, in a sake of safety, patient safety, we decided to to put another stand, so this is a, another Synergy 3016 with a tap technique and kissing, and again a final pot, uh, 4.512 high pressure non compliant balloon. And this is the final result. And that's the IVUS again, so you, you see we, we, we checked the the proximal or mid portion of the of the of the left main, we got more than 15 millimeters square in the area. Then then we checked uh, the the polygon on confluence, the the distal part of left main, with uh, also a very good result, less than 10 millimeters squ uh, square, more uh, 9.5, and uh, proximal LAD uh, with uh, 11 more, more than 11 millimeters. So. So you see that uh, it's just uh, conf um, I was confirmed a good uh, good result of the of the of the procedure. Uh, it goes well with the data we know. We all know this data published a couple of years ago by by Kang when they checked the IVUS uh, of all four segments uh, of the main. So it's the mid portion bifurcation or polygon of confluence, the the ostium of the LAD and ostium of the circ, and they found that. Uh, under expansion of a stent in at least one of those segments is uh, associated with uh, worse clinical uh, results. So the MACE rate was much higher in patients who did not fulfill uh, this 
thresholds, at least in one segment of the vessel. So, also, IVUS is uh, recommended by European Society of Cardiology. Uh, that's the guidelines on, on myocardial revascularization from 2014. So, in selected patients, uh, to optimize stent uh, implantation, and especially there is a left main uh, mentioned separately. Uh, to assess severity and optimize treatment of unprotected left main, uh, of left main lesion. Uh, and that's nine months, uh, three, three months, sorry, uh, angiography because of the protocol. The patient uh, came back uh, for angiography. You see very nice, very nice result. No pinching of the cirque. Uh, and this is the OCT, so proximal LAD, uh, well opposed strats, uh, it seems that most of them are nicely covered. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the bifurcation uh, of, the, of the left main at the ostium of the cirque, also very nicely uh, covered struts. Uh, and the whole left main uh, with some very, very minor, very tiny proliferation. Uh, so you see that the late loss is very, very, uh, very minor and uh, most of the struts seems to be nicely, nicely covered. So to summarize, a left main is a different animal. It's a, a very large vessel and current DS have limitations. So size matters. We, we, we have to know what is the expansion limit, expansion capacity of the stand we are using. Uh, it is important to know those capacities, of course, when choosing a stand, just have in mind whether this stand can fit uh, to this lesion. And of course, I was imagining, we, we, will, we were just discussing, I was imagining in the left main uh, just one session back on the, on, the, on the left main and there was a discussion among, among people, uh, the audience. Uh, it's not a must, but it helps a lot and especially for the left main, if you use a complex technique, complex strategy, two-stand strategy, it really helps you to optimize the, 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 the final result. Thank you very much for your attention. So any questions or comments? I mean, that was a beautiful example of, uh, uh, you're an expert on bifurcation, but you uh, are clearly, one of, the, one of the things people say about Ivers is I'm, I'm an expert and I know what it's going to show me. <laughs> uh, well, you're an expert in bifurcation, but clearly you still feel that the Ivers has something to teach you on an individual patient basis and to take you forward. Yeah, especially IVUS is a great tool when you have a problem. Yeah, what, what we found, uh, thanks to IVUS and also thanks to doing a lot of OCTs imaging, we found something that we, we, we felt that we are really experienced. We do like 150 11 main cases a year, so, so in, 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 in my cat lab. But we found a lot of something, what, what we call the, the stand deformation by the uh, guiding catheter, for example, for both sides, both kinds of stents, because if you, if you, before you oppose this, the stent at the ostium of the left main with a pot, and if you have some problems delivering the large uh, NC balloon, then it's very easy to touch, to touch the stent. So now what we learn from, from intravascular imaging that we disengage uh, the guiding catheter, especially before pulling back jail, uh, jailed wire, because as long as your wire is jailed in the cirque, your guide will always point directly to the edge of the stand. It will never intubate into the lumen. Yeah. So as long as the guide is jailed, uh, the, the wire is jailed, we disengage the guide to, uh, to, to keep it away from, from, from so, so that's, that's the one thing. Another thing is if you, if you cannot, for example, in complex technique, if you cannot deliver the balloon through the struts of a stand, to the side branch, then it's also very useful to use IVUS or, or, or any other, because then, then you see, in most of the cases, you will see that, that you are under the struts because the, the stand, stand was not very well opposed. And again, in left main, it's very easy because your guide, when you keep your guide uh, on the jail wire, will always, again, look at the abluminally. So if there is just a small gap between the stand strut and the vessel, you'll get the wire very easily under the strut. So, so it, really, it really helps. Uh, what I also notice uh, here and, and looking at live cases that people do IVUS and uh, just to, to check, okay, a position is good, expansion is good. 
but but now we try also to measure the, 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 the those diameters yeah, to, because sometimes you, you are happy because you fight one hour and you, you want to go and then you see that really the stand is under expanded and, and you, you could do much better if you take a little bit longer time bigger balloon and etc so I think it's not a must you don't have to do I was in in, in, in 100 percent of cases uh, but it really helps especially in the more complex case the higher the the advantage of, of using intravascular imaging yeah. The more that we know, the more we realize we, what we don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that actually does, does, you know, if you think back to that, the early uh, crush days when we were just trying to recross this thing and we were messing about and we had no idea why it wouldn't go back across. It's amazing looking back. It wasn't so long ago. Uh, but as we go forward, you know, again, I think the need for us to, to understand about the, uh, the optimal result. And this is all about the optimal result. And the optimal result then knocks on to a safe result in the long term and a, and a predictable result for the patient over the next few years. And I, I noticed that in the example that you showed, you only IVIS the left main and the LAD, but, but not the, the yeah, circ that's, osteum, that's the right which point. I would think is, is the, the crucial part. But what, what was yeah, the reason? We were, I think we were too lazy yeah, because really we didn't, I, we didn't IVIS uh, the circ. Which, you know, which, which is a, a stupid, of course, yeah, but... He knew that was fine. Because once you have a catheter <laughs> on, on the I'm table, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you, you were right. <laughs> That's a good point. No more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks Excellent a lot. talk. And I give the word to Aiden. So we've heard uh, a great session. We've seen a lot of complex an intervention. And uh, we've enjoyed, I think, seeing where intervention is going. When we set out on the session uh, today, we were looking to understand the potential benefits of this bioabsorbable polymer stent in, in high-risk bleeding patients and understand how we can carefully optimize our results using angioplasty and to see how colleagues are using this synergy stent in an increasingly complex patient subset. And one of the things I think that we must recognize is that that complexity has crept up on us from, from nowhere. You know, every cath list now, there's an 85-year-old with severe aortic stenosis who needs a left main. And no longer you think, my God, it, it's just another case. And all of this has happened really in the last three or four years just underneath us. And the complexity of these cases demands that we take them uh, with sufficient care, sufficient planning, and with the right appropriate tools to do the job. We've heard a lot today about how this longer uh, synergy stent may be helpful in a number of cases. And of course that comes from particularly its ability to be delivered, which is very important, but also its flexibility with regard to how that stent can be shaped to reflect the coronary anatomy, to reflect a smaller diameter at the bottom here and a bigger diameter at the top. And we've heard how even in the left main, you know, limited dual antiplate therapy may be valuable, and we look forward to seeing how that data translates going forward with regard to the detail of the study at Ideal Left Main. So for me, in the last 15, 20 years, we've gone from a position where we were very excited about, can we treat this? You know, can we treat the left main with a stent? It was, it was hugely exciting. We then had a period of reflection where we said, should we be doing this? And the syntax trial, I think, reflected both perhaps uh, misguided optimism and a, reflect in a period where we've kind of gathered ourselves slightly. And as I've said, I think the key point for us now is how do we do this better? How do we do it insightfully? How do we do it safely? And consequently, how do we then move into not only those patients where uh, stenting is all they have, but how do we move into the field of patients who could have a bypass operation where we're competing head-to-head -head with the surgeons, hopefully, in a preferential way for the patients? It's all about predictability. It's all about how we, can we get the sort of result that we want in a predictable way, and when we leave the patient with appropriate medical therapy, will that result stay for the long term? So I feel that we're in a position where we're confirming the existing indications for stents, and we've heard about that a lot today, but we're also moving into these new groups which we understand more about using physiology and how we might ultimately end up, as Simon Walsh has shown us, treating patients which were clearly untreatable 10 years ago. Boston have committed to a long uh, program of investigator-sponsored research. And over the next three slides, I'm just going to summarize 
those slides going forward. I'm going to highlight Syntax 2 as I have a massive vested interest, but that's an interesting trial which will look, and we see, we'll see that at the ESC uh, this summer, but looking at how in multivessel disease we might use physiology and this new stent with regard to uh, taking patients who would otherwise have surgery and treating them with coronary stents. We've heard about ideal left main in particular, and moving through the Celtic bivocation study there, all of these trials are complete, and then we've heard a little bit from, about POEM uh, in, the fine, in the initial presentation that we had today. And if we look at that and, and the way in which that disease has gone forward, we started off very much with a, uh, conventional indications for stent, if you like, relatively focal disease, and whether this new stent can perform as well as our existing uh, technology. We've confirmed that that's possible, and then we've then taken this technology into a much more demanding patient group, ultimately ending up with CTO, multivessel disease, and left main. It's an exciting time for coronary intervention. I welcome the fact that we have renewed momentum within the coronary sphere. I think it's terribly important for me as an interventionist, but more importantly, my patients, who I think will benefit hugely from the predictability and the performance of these new stents going forward. So with that, I'd like to thank Boston for putting this symposium together. My co-chair, Franz Joseph, thank you very much. The speakers and you for your attendance. Thank you very much indeed.